Hey internet, welcome to Worldview Everlasting, your favorite YouTube addiction. And on this week's Ask the Pastor 2.0, a question about OG sin. That'd be original sin for you youngins who don't know what OG means. Ah, yeah. uh, yes. Uh, and for you oldens who don't know what OG means, uh, it means original. Yeah, so OG sin, original sin. Here we go. <laughs> but first, it's time for your issues, etc. question of the week. Why do Lutherans accept the philoque of the Nicene Creed? <laughs> the philoque of the Nicene Creed. Rabbits. 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 The filioque of the Nicene Creed. It seems extremely strange to me that we accept something that was done by a local council instead of an ecumenical council and then was denied by two different popes until put in the creed by the decree of another pope. Ah, yes, the age-old Eastern Orthodox hatred of the Nicene Creed's filioque. Well, why do we hold to it? Because the entire Western Church holds to it and regardless of what political contrivings you have, we don't listen to councils because they're councils or because they're political contrivings or because they're tradition. We listen to them if and when they're true. And the filioque is frankly true. And so when you come along in the 1500s and it's been there for, well, for 1100 years, you don't change it if it's right. And it's just kind of the Lutheran view. You don't take away truth. We accept doctrine because scripture teaches it. And it is a fact that the Holy Spirit proceeds from both the Father and the Son. Jesus breathed on them. <sighs> Receive my spirit. That's pretty much proceeding. <laughs> it's like, no way. Way around it. Oh, this director is starting to want me the wrong way. Check out this interview with Reverend Peter Bender, where he talks about the Council of Nicaea and the process of adding the filioque, the and the son in Greek to the creed. Check it out. Email. Pastor Fist, describe original sin. It's not a question, that's a demand. I do what I'm told. Slash, the old Adam in us. So, would you like me to do that? Can, can, can I get a like, if you would be so kind? <laughs> Just kidding. I've heard different things and was wondering how you would respond in a question on what is the description of the original sin we inherit. I would respond the same way that Dr. Francis Pieper in his Christian Dogmatics would respond. This is a very, very awesome go-to text for anybody who really cares about what the scriptures say. <laughs> it is a little encyclopedic, so you know I wouldn't recommend picking it up and reading it cover to cover. No! But if you got these kinds of questions, it's very good. Even easier to get your hands on is a copy of Luther's Small Catechism and Explanation as published by Concordia Publishing House, which has this entire section in the back filled with questions just like yours. What is original sin? And then a bunch of texts in the Bible to go and look up and deal with it. Really pretty useful stuff, although I tend to go to Peeper. This is like black and white TV and Peeper's being at the ball game. <laughs> So let's just start, shall we? And I quote, Original sin, which is the sin which is not committed, but which is inborn in man since Adam's fall, embraces two things. Hereditary guilt, that means you're guilty when you're born, period, with the guilt from the one sin which Adam committed, and two, hereditary corruption, which by imputation of Adam's guilt is transmitted to all of his descendants. Romans 5, by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men, right? So think of it this way. We are all literally pieces of Adam. Hey, my Life be so hard. And, you know, science would affirm this, right? I mean, Eve was involved too. We're pieces of Eve. But like every one of us has the DNA of Adam. We are pieces of him. And that DNA has been genetically cursed by his sin. It shifted in its form. There was a cataclysm which changed the very, not nature of man, but fused itself to the nature of man and so fully corrupted it that we are diseased. You're such a disease. It is a disease of the soul. All the diseases of our physical bodies are a result of this disease of the soul called original sin, which leaves not a single one of us unguilty, even the unborn, and which has the effect of us producing actual committable sins as we get older. And we do, we just get worse at that. Like the selfishness of the baby is pretty selfish as he cries for food and change the diaper. But man, hey, there's some lip on them 12 year olds, you know what I'm saying? And 12 year olds, they don't compare to dirty old men. <laughs> Hmm? Now, of course, in particular, the doctrine of original guilt has aroused the antagonism of man. Nobody who's born guilty wants to believe it. We all say, that's not fair. I never got a chance to, like, be righteous. <laughs> 
Now in particular, the Pelagians, the Socinians, the Arminians, and the Quakers, and even some modern Lutherans, <gasps> insist that the only guilt that can be charged against any human being is one for something that they commit. But they're really not understanding what Jesus means when he talks about a bad tree bearing bad fruit. If the root is bad, the fruit's gonna be bad. If there's poison in the water going into the tree, you'd throw out the apple because it's a bad apple. Like you're not gonna like give the apple a chance. It can't have a chance. It's already ruined. And it's understandable. This is the, the, the sentiment of the human heart rising up against what is a perception of injustice, but the fact of scripture is that it's not injustice, it's perfectly just. We're the injustice. All of us are born with corruption as a result of the guilt that we inherit, not vice versa. And if you don't like the fact that because of one man who's not you, you're condemned, it's kind of hard to like the fact that because of one man who's not you, you're saved. There's a parallel going on here, and it's a good thing, ultimately. Think about it, though. Now, with hereditary corruption, there's not so much doubt. It's pretty obvious that uh, people are, you know, people make mistakes to say it the nicest way. But either way, the full understanding of that inherited corruption can only be understood by clear statements from scripture. The human nature would still try to find some good in it. We would think that our reason still just has a little dirt on it that needs to be polished off with some education. As opposed to understanding that our reason is one of the worst idols we have and leads us into all manner of evil and atrocity and even unreason if we let it go unchecked and without the revelation of God. If you want to deny evolution and live in your in your uh, world that's completely inconsistent with everything we observe in the universe, that's fine. <laughs> Original sin in this way, even the corruption is an article of faith that must be believed. Before I can see my sin and understand my sin, I just have to believe that it's there. Then, believing that it's there, eventually I'm gonna find it. And thankfully, because it's through faith, as I find it, I'm gonna repent of it and take it to the cross. But this happens through these statements of scripture, such as, you know, Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful above all things who can understand it. Whereas, you know, if we let our reason work with it, when you wish upon a star, your dreams come true, the Disney version, the heart is this wonderful, beautiful thing that if we all just follow it, everything works out. Follow your heart. Follow your heart. Kind of different levels of understanding corruption. So we call this then total depravity or hereditary depravity, that man is in fact born evil. And Jesus says as much at various times to the people he's talking to. You who are evil, even you know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more does a father in heaven who's actually good know how to take care of you, his enemies, who he's bought with his own blood and has restored to sonship. Even so, as clear as this is in scripture, there are those who deny this total depravity of the sinner. And they do it in these ways. They do it by denying it altogether, claiming that children come out innocent and then only, you know, eventually earn their way to corruption by decisions or in, in the modern age, we would say by lack of education. You know, education is the great movement to try to get rid of evil in the world. How can we be expected to teach children to learn how to read? if they can't even fit inside the building. Yeah, that's gonna work. So it's all by example or societal imputation, you know, the, the, the society has formed you to do this, but it's not really you. If we left you in the woods, you'd grow up good. Another way they deny it. Admitting the corruption there, but refusing to say that it's sin. And you'll see this in many Christian groups who now claim they no longer sin, but they'll admit they still make mistakes, right? And they, they kind of deny the two, or they'll say that what's going on inside the heart isn't really sin, it's only the actions that are sin. They admit that there's some corruption going on, but they don't think it's guilty or it counts as sin. And then you have the semi-Pelagians who are like this in a sense, who just minimize the hereditary corruption. So they say that it's there, but it's not as bad as you think it is. And so, you know, God does what he can to save you, but you can meet him halfway, that kind of stuff. Jesus is reaching out with the gospel. You just have to reach out and accept it. <laughs> I threw up. That kind of stuff. This is a denial of original sin and the total depravity of man's will. It is a failure to regard the fallen man as dead, as Paul calls us in Ephesians when he says, you were, were dead in your trespasses and sins. The level of power ascribed to man in these groups is going to be different, but it all has the same net effect of denying the full depravity of your sin, which has a net effect of minimizing the value of the gospel, which is the sad thing. So that you no longer need to, nor can rely fully on God's grace, right? You think it's need to, but the fact is it's can. It's a lack of security, which undermines your faith and leads to doubt. And that's like not what God wants. That's what the devil wants. So I quote again. <laughs> Every minimizing of the hereditary corruption, whether in crass, papist, Arminian form, or in a finer or the finest form in which it has crept into the Lutheran church, involves a denial of the sola gratia, the grace alone, and accordingly then, the whole Christian religion. This fact is so important that it calls for an entire separate chapter on the effects of original sin on the mind and will of man. That'd be chapter two. You should check it out. Until you do, and until next time, you know, just keep in mind this is one of the last 
fast, uh, high style uh, Wii TVs you're going to get for a couple of weeks to a month and a half, but we're going to be having updates all the way through the move, and we're looking forward to doing even more, maybe getting some like live TV going again. That'd be a real exciting thing. Not sure yet. Got to get there. Got to get settled, but I will be making those updates. Get any Greek Tuesday ask the pastor quick shots in the meantime. While you're waiting, you know, we still need your help with the Lutheran Ninja Clan to get Peter to that point where he is full time and can devote himself to not only producing more content, but then traveling to various venues, evangelical conferences and whatnot, and getting this content into the hands of evangelicals, perhaps like you, who are also starving, grasping, looking for some confidence because their Pelagian teaching about the will is undermining their faith little by little and starving them to death. So we want to get that mission underway. You can help us by joining the Lutheran Ninja Clan or joining for more than you already do, getting us into your church budget and whatnot. Anyhow, you can also like and share these things because you probably found this stuff on the internet and you know it was because somebody shared it with you. Whatever you do, just like Francis Pieper, rock on.